to the diminishment or the removal of this topography. So the Teton Range um, and to a lesser extent, the Madison and Gallatin Ranges in the north are the most recent um, major fault bounded ranges to be um, intersected by the Yellowstone hotspot. And so this place provided a really ideal um, opportunity to, to look at this mechanism of topographic removal and think about how this whole process might have happened. Um, this is a huge project, as I mentioned. There's a lot of different facets to it. And when I started to make the acknowledgement slide, I actually started to run out of room. Um, but these are my uh, three colleagues. Kevin Yeager's not pictured here. Um, he's one of the co-PIs. Um, Mike McGlue's my uh, lakes colleague who helps with all the lake coring work. Ed Woolery's our um, paleo, uh, or he's a geophysicist, but um, we have him sort of moonlighting as a paleo seismologist. Um, and Kevin Yeager does a radiochemistry, so he's one of our um, recent geochronology people. My wife, Summer Brown, started the project. Um, she's also our resident, um, our resident uh, photographer and collects a lot of the media that we use in this project. Willie Gunther's where we run our samples at University of Illinois. Um, the students would tell you that the most valuable member of the team last year was my father, <laughs> who was out here to cook for them. Um, as soon as he left, the meals went downhill rapidly. Um, Ryan Goldsby is my PhD student working in the Northern Tetons now. This is actually from a couple weeks ago when I was here with him um, mapping in the Huckleberry Ridge. Um, this picture's never going away, probably. Um, but this is my two first two students that worked on this project, Rachel Hoare and Meredith Swalham in Yellowstone, doing something weird. Sarah Johnson, another PhD student that worked with me on this project, mostly looking at the landscape evolution. Um, Autumn Helfrich's work is key to what I'm going to show tonight. This is the uplift modeling. And then I have a ton of undergraduates um, that actually worked on this project as well, and I couldn't fit them all in. So I just took our group photo <laughs> and stuck them in here. But almost every single person that's worked in our lab has had um, some part in this project. So I'm going to use some terminology tonight. I'm going to try to keep this as basic as I can. I apologize. There are some technical aspects that, that I have to deal with. But um, in doing this, I wanted to introduce just a few terms to make it a little bit easier. So when we talk about displacement on the Teton Fault, this is one of the things that, that this talk is going to focus on. We're talking about the total amount of motion um, across the Teton Fault, but that actually has two components. Um, most of that displacement is actually accommodated um, by what we call hanging wall drop, and that's what creates the beautiful um, Jackson Hole Valley and um, all its uh, $7 million an acre real estate. The mountains themselves are actually part of the footwall uplift, and I'm going to show you how this happens geodynamically, why this happens. And these, this is not um, a, a weird fault by any means. If you drive across um, Nevada, you'll drive across what we call the Basin Range, which we think this mountain range is a part of, um, believe it or not, on the far northeastern corner. But these footwalls of these faults always uplift, and the hanging walls are always dropped, and so you get mountains and valleys or basins and ranges. Um, and so you'll hear me um, talking about these things. So when we first came here, what Summer came to do, my, my wife came to do, was to try to figure out what was the age of the Teton Range. Nobody really knew, and there was a wide range of guesses or a wide range of ideas about it that largely included circumstantial evidence. And so Summer came here with the idea that we would use this technique called um, thermochronology, and we would date the cooling or the uplift of the mountains, and that would tell us when the fault is moving. It's a, it's a complicated process, but I'm gonna try to simplify it a little bit. Basically, we have these grains called appetites. Um, this is them here on the right, these gorgeous looking things. They never look like that in the Tetons. Um, they look really horrible here, and our collaborator, Willie, who does this for a living, calls them crapitites um, in the Tetons. But basically what happens is these grains store uranium, thorium, and samarium, and over time, as the, um, these radiogenic products break down, they release helium. When these grains are hotter than 70 degrees C, they, they don't store that helium. It leaves the grain. As soon as that grain is, is being brought towards the surface and it cools through a temperature of about 70 degrees C, that helium starts being stored in the grain and the clock starts ticking. And it tells us when that grain had moved to the surface. So, what we do is we go out in the, in the mountain range um, and we actually um, will collect samples along these transects. And so what I'm showing here, we've got, say these are three different uh, rocks containing this apatite mineral. 
Um, down here in the hotter parts, this guy's clock's not started ticking yet. Um, right here, as we go through the closure temperature, this, this guy's clock is just starting to tick. And this guy here that's near the surface, his clock's been ticking for a while. So he, he's been timing how long it's been since he went through that closure window. Um, so if we go out in the mountains, we actually will climb to the top of these things and we'll just start collecting. And we usually collect them about every 200 meters of elevation, moving down the front of the mountain, which is sort of the, the front of the fault. Collect them all the way to the bottom if we can. Um, and then we'll date these samples. And what we'll see is usually a trend where they get their oldest at the top and they get younger going towards the base. And that's because if you imagine this block uplifting, this red sample down here in the bottom is going to be the last one to cool, the last one to make it to the surface. So it's going to be younger. It's going to have a younger age. The ones at the top are going to be older. And if we're lucky, we, we might even see a break in this age elevation relationship. And that'll tell us the age of when the faulting started, when the uplift starts. So um, we'll separate those. You'll see this in some of the figures I'm going to show by what we call slow cooling, you know, sort of background erosion versus fast cooling. And that's when the fault gets moving. So um, collecting these transects is um, interesting. Anybody that's climbed in these mountains can tell you that it's, it's sort of one of these weird mountain ranges where you can always, almost always, not always, but almost always see your car from wherever you are. And it lulls you into a sense of complacency, but it's a completely different world. Um, so this is me and, and one of my climbing partners. Uh, you can see him up here at the end of this rope. This is on the Exum Ridge of the Grand. We're about, um, this is the last, really the last rope pitch um for the people that climb it with the rope um but you can see so we're about 400 feet from the summit and you can see this huge cloud coming in this cloud was producing lightning um, we couldn't see it until we came up over the shoulder of this thing and then it was faster for us to go up and over um, we had a weird um conversation at the top about whether or not you could get hit by lightning if you're actually above it in altitude and elevation um, i think the answer is you probably still can but um, it was a crazy storm. My wife was actually in the valley um, with my buddy's girlfriend waiting for us. Um, and it broke like a wave over the mountains. And this is a picture she took of it coming in. Um, so we were somewhere in here where the olive-sized hail was falling. So um, it, was a, it was a crazy storm. Actually, another climber um, that same day was, was killed in the storm. So um, it, it's also the, you know, it's, it's a dangerous place to work sometimes, but it's really, really exciting. Um, so we do, we go out and we collect these transects up this peak. So in 2008, we collected one up Mount Moran, we collected one up the Grand, and we collected one um, straight up rendezvous, actually when they were replacing the tram cable, because we got in trouble a bunch of times for being there, like in the way of where they were moving the tram cable. Um, we collected one, uh, Rachel and I, Rachel's here tonight, Rachel and I collected a transect up Eagle's Rest Peak um, a few years ago, and actually some of my students went back up Eagle's Rest Peak um, last year. And Ranger Peak, Ryan's here. Ryan collected, Ryan, along with another student of mine, Meredith, that's coming this weekend for the geophysics, they collected a transect up Ranger Peak. Um, Sam, another one of our students who I think was on the call tonight, um, was actually injured on this transect. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, it's a different, different kind of work. Um, but once we've collected these transects and we've dated these appetite grains along the transect, we put them into this fancy software, and I won't bore you with the details, but it's called inverse thermal history modeling. We essentially tell this model, here's the possible temperature space these rocks could have gone through, and here's the time it could have happened. And we let, these, let this model run and solve for the space that's acceptable for these ages. And so this is the Moran transect. You can see these are the samples. That's the summit sample. Um, actually, this sample was taken right below the summit because we, we didn't want to get into the flathead sandstone because it doesn't give good appetite. So this was taken in the basement immediately below the unconformity that you can see. I'm going all the way down to the bottom at Lee Lake. These are those samples. And you, what this is showing is the temperature time history those rocks could have experienced. Um, and you can see there's this really sharp event right here where all of these things start cooling really rapidly. And this we see in this every one of these models for every transect at about 10 million years. So we're provisionally saying that the, the Teton range started growing about 10 million years ago. There is this, there's an earlier sort of weird uplift event in here that we haven't been able to well constrain. We may need to use some other techniques. I'm not gonna talk about it much, but there, is, there are some other complexities in here from the last time I showed you this data set. Um, but I won't get into that today, but just remember that the important thing here is that this fault starts moving at 10 million years. 
the Yellowstone hotspot gets here two million years ago. So this mountain range probably grew quite tall for eight million years before the Yellowstone hotspot shows up. So um, in these models, it tells us because we have this thermal history through time, now we wanna take that magnitude of cooling and we're gonna convert it to the amount of foot wall uplift. We wanna know how much the Teton range has uplifted over that 10 million years. To do this, once again, we, we have to get into modeling space and I'm not gonna bore you with the details. I didn't even put the equations in here because I hate it when people do that in their talks. But the idea here is that we're gonna build some thermal models of the crust and we're going to use those thermal models to figure out how much uplift we get for a given amount of cooling that came from the last, um, the last model that you saw. In the crust, the heat can only really come from two places. It can come from the mantle, which is what happens underneath Yellowstone, where the mantle heat flows up into the crust um, and eventually gets to the surface. But the other way that we actually produce crustal heat, the way we produce most crustal heat, is actually through radiogenic decay. So there's a lot of minerals with a lot of radiogenic material in them. They decay, they heat the crust up. So we don't know exactly how thick the crust is here exactly. We know it's basement. We know it's, it's thick. It, you know, it's 30 kilometers. It's something thick. But we don't know the various components of this. And it's a big, you know, it's a big challenge. But it turns out we have a ton of measurements of surface heat flow, because, um, mostly because this area is so interesting for geothermal energy. There's, there's measurements everywhere. So we have these incredible maps um, of what the surface heat flow looks like. And the heat flow at the surface is the combined product of that mantle heat flow and that radiogenic heat production. And it doesn't matter how you put them together. It will change some of the slopes and some of the, you know, the curve of the gradient, but it really doesn't change the whole thing. So we said, okay, we can take this surface heat flow and we can use it to figure out how hot it is in the crust. And we can use that, that gradient to figure out what the uplift of our rocks is. And so you can see it's important to pay attention because these transects we've been doing, um, that heat flow changes rapidly as we approach Yellowstone. So this is all cold mid-continent rocks over here in the blue old basement, you know, the kind of stuff you find under, under Kansas. Um, and then over here where everything's really high, well, obviously that's the Snake River Plain, the Yellowstone hotspot track. This is the modern basin range where we have all this heat and extension going on. But we um, calibrated our thermal models to figure out the geothermal gradient beneath each one of our transects. And you can see it increasing substantially from the north. So this will be the rendezvous transect here. This is Eagle's Rest Peak here. Actually, our new Ranger Peak transect will be even hotter when we run those models. But when we do this, when we get this geothermal gradient and take the cooling from the last model that I showed you, we can come up with the amount of footwall uplift that the range experienced. And at Mount Moran, where we have our best calibrated model, we think it's about 3.1 kilometers. So the displacement that I talked about in the beginning, remember I said it, the footwall uplift is a part of it, the hanging wall drops apart, and the footwall uplift here is about 3.1 kilometers, and it's, it's the minority. So this is, this is a lot of motion on this fault. Um, this actually wouldn't be a, a, a crazy amount of uplift to think about, because remember, we have to remove you know, one and a half, two kilometers of Paleozoic section off the top. And we know it was there because it's still there, only about six feet of it. In 10,000 years, people may not get to enjoy that, that little snippet of geologic time. So um, if we know Mount Moran is, has an uplift of 3.1 kilometers, that really only tells us half of the story as far as working out the displacement on the fault. So the next thing we did, this is work um, by my recently graduated student, Autumn Helfrich. Um, Autumn built these flexural kinematic models that basically take in a bunch of parameters, um, evaluate them against the Teton fault, against the flexural profile, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second, um, and then put in different amounts of displacement to figure out how the fault accommodates footwall uplift versus hanging wall drop. And so this is a sequence of one of those models, but what, we, what happens when the crust extends like this, like a big normal fault? Um, is we actually pulling the crust apart along this fault. But as it thins the crust underneath that fault, um, it allows this hot, buoyant mantle material to rise up. And that rising up material pushes the foot wall of the fault up in the air. This is why we get mountains when we have normal faults, crustal scale normal faults. It's pushing that, that foot wall up in the air as the hanging wall drops. Um, 
obviously when this happens, this, these things make basins and these basins fill in with sediment, just like we've got today. I'm going to show you how that works. But basically, Autumn was able to work out um, doing these calibrated models, how much footwall uplift and hanging wall drop probably happened on the Teton Fault as a percentage so that we can convert our footwall uplift into a, a hanging wall drop. You can see here, one of the things I always point out that's really interesting, a lot of the total displacement um, profiles for the Teton Fault are less than seven kilometers, a lot of estimates of displacement. Um, with seven kilometers of displacement, we can only get two kilometers of total footwall uplift, which is less than the relief on the modern day Grand Teton. So that's going to be really important, right? It's got to be more than that. Um, to work this out, though, what we had to do, um, we have to figure out the flexural parameters that fit the mountain range. And so um, the top diagram you see here, this is what we call swath topography. It's basically taking um, a cross section shown here through some topography and averaging it. So you have a mean topography, you have a max, and you have a min. And so this profile that you see here, this curve is called the flexural profile of the footwall block. And it's a factor of the rigidity of the crust here, the thickness of the crust, all these parameters we didn't know the answer to. But because this place is so spectacularly exposed on the western flank of this mountain range, it's one of the few places in the world, I mean, outside of the Himalayan and Patagonian four deeps, I can't think of an easier example for determining a flexural profile that matches a given set of parameters. And so what Autumn did was started doing things like um, putting in depth of detachment. This is how deep the Teton normal fault goes before it goes kind of flat or listric, right? All these big crustal faults have to do that. Um, the TE, that's effective elastic thickness. That's like the stiffness of the crust. Is it, you know, is it thin like a piece of paper or is it stiff like a, like a board? Um, and once again, I won't bore you with all of the details of these things, but she ran all of these models and was able to come out with a set of parameters um, that would produce a flexural profile that had the shape and the wavelength of the Teton fault. And it was a singular solution um, for a given set of parameters. Um, they're shown here that it's not important. The only one that might jump out to some people um, is this number, five kilometers for T. That's pretty low. And we think that's something to do with um, this thing being on the margin of the hot spot and the crust being disturbed through that region. That's That's a thin number. But you can see this, this is the outcome of that model that she ran. Um, this is not including erosion yet, which is why it stands so much taller, but this is what it looks like. And you even get the, the pop-up over here um, in the Grovance. Um, it doesn't match it perfectly over there, but you know the footwall pop-ups are a little difficult. What we're most interested in is the wavelength of this profile, the shape of it, and the width of the subsequent basin that it produces, which matches the width of the Jackson Basin really nice. Okay. So once Autumn had done all that, we said, okay, we, I think we can make a reasonable estimate about the displacement that's, that's happening on this fault. Um, and we published this in 2021 um, in this paper, in the Thickpin et al. paper, um, in Autumn's thesis. Um, and um, you can see that th these are the, the values that we get. So at Rendezvous Peak, we had about nine kilometers. Um, at Mount Moran, we had um, about 11.4 to 12.6 kilometers of displacement, which we think is the highest displacement anywhere along the fault. Um, and at Eagles Rest Peak, um, that number actually starts to go down a little get, bit, which is what we expect. We expect the maximum displacement to be at the center of the fault. And we're calling, our group is calling Mount Moran the center of the fault, not the Grand, because a lot of people think, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, but we think Mount Moran has the most displacement, has experienced the most uplift, um, and is thus probably the geometric center of the Teton Fault with displacement decreasing in both directions moving away from Mount Moran. Now, the problem was um, this was a very um, controversial idea. One, because the displacement estimates were higher than anyone had ever estimated. Two, was because it was going to require that the Teton Fault was originally much longer than anyone imagined. So these are um, length displacement scaling relationships for normal faults. And this is a global data set. So this is all the places where we can actually measure the length of a fault, measure its displacement, and it's plotted on this graph. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to this graph in just a moment. But basically the idea is that a fault, a fault um, displacement, when it increases, the, eventually the length of the fault has to increase. You can't have a fault with five kilometers of displacement that's one kilometer long. 
It's physically impossible. And so in this empirical data set, um, what you'll see is that th these sort of minimum values for length displacement scaling, which is usually about 10 to one to 20 to one um, length to displacement. So if I got one kilometer displacement, I'm probably gonna need a 10 kilometer fault based on these values. Well, that meant that if we had a 12 kilometer displacement on the Teton fault, the minimum, the absolute minimum length of the fault had to be like 120 kilometers. And it's actually more, I'm gonna show you the estimates we come up with are actually higher than that. But the fault that as most of us know it today was only about 65 kilometers. And we, we put this out in 2019 starting, um, and it was very controversial. People either loved it or hated it. Um, so it was, it was very controversial. Um, and so we said, okay, look, we're, we're doing this as simply as we can, like we're taking the most conservative estimate, the, the length could actually be out here, you know, somewhere, and um, we're taking this really conservative estimate, um, and we're estimating now based on these are our best estimates so far, um, that the Teton fault would have had to be about 190 to 210 kilometers long. Well, this means that it would have had to have extended um, 95 to 105 kilometers north of Mount Moran, which puts it well into the Yellowstone hotspot and potentially all the way up to the Gallatin Fault, which is a whole nother story that I'm gonna show at the end, a brief one, I promise. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of people draw the Teton Fault on maps as stopping at the Cache Creek Fault, but if you look at Love's legendary mapping from down there, um, he does the right thing and blows it right through there because it's younger than those faults. It should offset them unless it's transferring displacement to them. Now that caveat is really important um, and it's not something I'm going to get into today, but it is the subject of a pending USGS EDMAP grant that um, Ryan Goldsby will have to come back out here and do next year. So he's going to be really busy. I haven't told you about that yet, have I? Yeah, we're working on it. Um, so one thing I do want to mention that, that I think about a lot, and I probably don't say enough, is that this, a lot of people have not accepted this length and displacement for the Teton fault. And for obvious reasons, a lot, of the, a lot of the section of it, maybe you can't see it, but the Wasatch fault, which I consider probably to be in style, relief, location, the closest equivalent to the Teton fault has about 12 kilometers of displacement and its mapped length is almost 300 kilometers. So keep that in mind. Okay, because though it was so controversial, we said, okay, we're gonna take this the next step. We're gonna take Autumn's flexural model we're going to put it in a, we're going to put a thermal field on it in 2D and we're going to run it. And we're going to use a piece of software. It's a model um, package called P-Cube um, that will not only run a thermal model for us of this fault evolution, but when it's done, it's going to tell us the ages of those appetite grains that we talked about at the beginning. So for a given amount of displacement and a given timing of, of onset of faulting, it's going to predict what those ages would have been along the transects that we collected. So the way this thing works, is just, we took Autumn's model, it sits in a thermal field and you can see the fault just offsetting um, that, the blue area there at the top right here, that's the Jackson Hole Basin filling in, the mountain range going up on the other side. Um, so you can see that whole thing. Um, when we're doing this, this is that same model again, except now below it, I have um, the distance along, along the model. So from 100 to 200 kilometers, this was a 300 kilometer long model, if you can believe it. Um, only this middle part's really interesting. But up here, I have these different thermocron systems. So the appetite helium system is shown in green. That's the grains we talked about. I'm not gonna talk about these other systems, but they're, um, the appetite fission one, track one is an important part of the story that we won't get into today, but if you're interested, I can, um, I can send you the, I'm happy to send anyone the paper so they can read about it. Um, but you'll see as this thing moves along, those ages are getting older and they're getting older because the model is aging, right? So the, the grains start at some age and you'll see them getting older um, as they move up the screen. And then all of a sudden you're gonna see as the, model, whoop, as the model continues that some of those ages start getting younger and younger. And what this is, this is the fault moving to the point that it's starting to bring up those young, hot ages. Those grains that were at depth, that were reset when the fault started moving and now they've been exhumed to the surface and they give us this young age that we see here. Um, I think at this, this is time step four, I think we're at like eight kilometers of offset here. So the first time that we even see a single one of these young ages that we see all along the fault, every, all on the base of the fault, every single age is younger than 10 million years or right about 10 million years, everywhere. 
this is the first time at eight kilometers of displacement that we actually see an age that's that young. If we keep going, um, we'll get more and more younger ages. Those app, and you'll see the whole um, now the whole flexural profile. This is that back flexural limb here is starting to get younger because there's so much exhumation happening. Um, and when we get to the final time step, the last step here, um, you're going to see this blue line drop down. That's the appetite fission track age. That is the age um, that that sample is being brought from a temperature of 110 degrees C to the surface. So after 17 kilometers of displacement, we bring one of these guys to the to the front. I don't belabor this very much because we only have two of these ages, both of them near the base of Mount Moran. Both of them are younger than 10 million years. So we're getting 17 kilometers of displacement to produce that age. Now, there's some some hair on that age, we'll say. So we don't really pound the table about it yet. So I'm not going to talk about the fission track again, but this is really important. So this is what um, these models are capable of doing. So um, I'm going to show you what those models look like. We ran models for 9, 11, 13, 15, and 17 kilometers of displacement. Um, I'm going to show you what those look like, but I need to explain a couple of things that you'll be looking for. So um, these are the what, what we call age elevation profiles. So remember the diagram where I showed the colored dots going up the mountain. That's, the, that's that, but this is for um, actual transects. So this is for um, static peak, and, and this shows where those samples were collected. Um, the Grand Teton transect shows here in white. Actually, we're slowly, um, Ryan is slowly replacing um, that transect with the Tiwanot transect. This, this transect was collected, but we're still running this data. This is, we hope this is gonna be a better representation for the fault since this one kind of curves around and does weird things. Um, and then our best transect, the Moran transect, which goes straight up. Um, if any of you have ever been up the CMC route, it goes straight up the CMC route, just to the left of the Black Dyke, all the way to the top. Well, what do we see? Well, remember I said we should see a break between fast and slow cooling in these transects. Um, and that's kind of what we see with, with one caveat. These uh, red lines are showing the trend along these um, appetite ages. These are average ages of, of a bunch of grains um, for these transects. And then you see this sharp drop down here along the yellow line. This is us calculating the um, depth at which, or the elevation at which um, we would expect that zero age grain to be. Where is that grain at, you know, at, at 70 degrees C that hasn't had its clock start ticking yet? Because that's gotta be down there somewhere, right? Um, otherwise it would be, you know, if there's a zero age grain up here at 2000 meters, then sitting next to Jackson Lake, it would be 70 degrees C, right? I felt like that this afternoon. <laughs> um, but at static peak, what we see, and we, we see about the same thing in all these models, except for Moran, um, we see that slow cooling, this is background before uplift cooling um, of about 41 meters per million years, right? This is really slow. This is like, this is how fast probably Kansas erodes, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and you see the same thing for static peak, we broke those up into two trends, about 30 and 10, it's about the same thing. But when we get into the steeper part of the transect um, after 10 million years, that's reflecting the uplift, we start seeing values more in the 222 meters per million years, um, all the way up to 367 meters per million years. And I just want you to remember those ballpark numbers when I show you these model results, because this is really what we're focused on. We're focused on the trend that these are following. So this was the nine kilometer um, offset model you can see. So the graphs we're looking at, this is elevation from the model. And this is the helium age that you get. And these are the displacement steps getting to that final nine kilometers. This is what that model looks like. I put these purple layers on here. The, all this color here is the temperature in the subsurface. There's not a lot going on there that's super interesting. So I, I, I did cover some of it up because I think it makes it better to see this. But you could think about these purple units maybe as your Paleozoic material that needs to be removed. Um, and this yellow stuff is going to be the stuff that fills in the Jackson Hole Basin. Um, and you're, what you're seeing is, is sort of the samples here in the foot wall being brought to the surface. And the ages that we're looking at are only ages that are going to be along this transect. So early in that evolution at, say, two or four kilometers of displacement, those ages are still really old because we haven't brought, we haven't exhumed the foot wall enough to have those young ages at the surface yet. Um, but once we get to eight kilometers of displacement, um, we start seeing those young ages, you know, 10, nine, th this model starts moving at, at, at 10 million years ago. Um, we start seeing those young ages and up at high elevation though, 
we're still seeing the old ages. So you can imagine up here on top of the mountain in this model, um, our age is about 40 million years. And down here, we've got that young reset age. So at eight, nine kilometers of displacement, we're actually able to bring some young samples to the, to the bottom. Um, the challenge, of course, is that we're looking at a gradient of only about 44 meters per million years. That's because we, we don't have enough samples in the transect yet. We don't have enough exhumed um, to have a steeper gradient over here. But we're, we, what we can say, though, confidently is that we need about nine kilometers of displacement to even produce one of these young ages that you see at the bottom of the transect. And if we don't get at least that much displacement, we can't, can't do this. At 11 kilometers, um, we see that about the same trend of the model um, for the, the slow part of the cooling, about 43 meters per million years. But then look at this. Um, then we jump to at 11 kilometers, we're seeing 223, uh, 223 meters per million years. That's about what we see at static peak. And our predictions for static peak from the foot wall uplifts that we saw were about 9.5 to 10 kilometers, right? So it's pretty close. 11 kilometers would be close. I bet if we ran a model with 10 kilometers of offset, we would see something that's almost identical to static peak. Um, we move up to um, 13 kilometers of total offset. Um, now we're starting to see uh, these higher values, 255. Um, we're, we're seeing a nice deep, this nice deep transect developing with these really young ages. Um, once again, these old ages over here are just those first steps as the bottle's building up. And then it starts kicking out these, these young guys as, the, as these young guys make it to the surface here in the foot wall. Um, 15, we're just gonna keep going up, 335. We still haven't hit here. We still haven't hit what we see at Mount Moran, which was 367. Um, when we get to 17 kilometers, um, we get up to 390, which is greater than Mount Moran. And, and honestly, this model's probably too much displacement because it's got really young samples, um, 2.5 kilometers above the valley. I mean, that would be like putting a reset appetite age almost above the Grand Teton. So that's probably too much, right? But we've zeroed in quite nicely. It, it's, it can't be less than nine. It looks like it's probably more in the 11 to 13 range and 17 is probably too much. So we feel quite confident about our original estimate of 11.4 to 12.6, maybe it's 13, we don't really care. 10, 11, 12, 13, it's a lot more than two or three, right? It's a big, it's a big amount of displacement. Okay, so if we go back to that model and we say, okay, we believe you, Ryan, and you don't have to say it out loud, um, I know that the, I know that people pick sides in, in this community over this topic, um, but if we believe that those displacements are reasonable, the 11.4 to 12.6 based on the models I just showed you, or maybe even a little higher, then once again, we're required by this empirical relationship. I mean, the only place where faults do not meet this empirical relationship is on Mars. And the only reason why, gravity is different. So the physics are a little bit different. Pretty sure the gravity is not different here, although the gravity of sitting in the traffic out here the last couple of years has been pretty substantial. But if we believe that this, th these links are reasonable, then we have to ask ourselves, did the modern Teton fault, um, or, or the, sorry, the Paleo Teton fault once extend well into the hotspot track? And, where, and if it did, where did it go? Did the Yellowstone hotspot anneal it, erase it? What happened to it? So this is the last thing I'm gonna show you. Um, so this is what faults actually look like in 3D. Um, most people um, that have never spent way too much of their lives thinking about faults probably haven't thought about it this way. Um, they actually form ellipses. Their maximum displacement is in the middle of the ellipse here, and then it sort of decreases towards the tips. So I tried to draw these. This would be that sort of 85 kilometer extension shown here in the pink. Um, this green one, this 105 kilometers, would get maybe all the way up to the Gallatin range. I should also mention that based on some preliminary work that Rachel actually did in her thesis um, a few years ago, where we collected some helium samples from the Gallatin range, um, the age of this structure is basically the same as the Tetons. It, we, don't, it's not a, we don't have a, like a really good constraint on it, but the ages that we get out of this, um, out of this range are, are pretty close to the same. So, which was interesting. We'll just call it interesting for now. So, the next thing that happened, um, this, this is brand new stuff that we haven't shown um, at all yet, actually. I think at GSA will be the first time we'll show it, um, is Yellowstone flew a LIDAR survey, I think it was in the fall of 2020. And most people haven't seen this data yet because a DEM, like a clean DEM of it, hasn't been produced to my knowledge yet. 
we found the raw point cloud on a public server um, where they dumped this stuff. And it just so happens that the University of Kentucky, um, the Kentucky Geological Survey in particular, um, is a LIDAR center of excellence. And I've just made that term up. I don't know if that's actually a real thing. But um, it turns out we have some really incredible LIDAR people there. And so I called them and said, can you teach my students how to process this Yellowstone LIDAR? And they said, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, so they did it and they did the whole entire park. So we have a DEM, the whole park, if anybody's interested in looking at it, playing with it, it really is incredible. So we are gonna start, I'm gonna show you these four tiles that we've just mapped. Um, this is just north of Jackson Lake. Um, right down here, um, this little, these liniments you see down here, this is the, what the Steamboat Mountain segment of the Teton Fault that came out in the 2014 LIDAR data set. And Glenn Thackeray and Mark Zellman and some others got up there and trenched it, proved that it had the same earthquakes as the Teton Fault. It's really kind of exciting. But what happens down here is that um, it sort of disappears into the Snake River Plain. The fault is in Jackson Lake and parts of it cross Jackson Lake at Steamboat. Something happens and it's gone. Um, but then all of a sudden we get all these ruptures again. And what's really incredible about all these faults is that not only that you can map them perfectly, this is what Ryan's doing. This Alex and Ryan, um, the last month have basically been up here um, smashing through these bushes, <laughs> not really smashing through, but, but hiking around and mapping all this stuff out. So love, David Love mapped this as, at a recon 62.5 scale years ago. And Ryan and Alex are mapping, we're mapping it on the LIDAR data. So I like to think that when we're doing it digitally, so I think I mean, we got to be mapping it like one to five or one to 10,000. I mean, just an incredible scale. Um, but we're trying to work these faults out. But what you can see, the, what we've mapped here in red are every single um, ground rupture, um, modern ground rupture that we can see. And remember that this, these are probably minimums because you can see the glacial stria here have run over the top of these. What's really incredible about this, though, is that because there's so many overlapping flows up here, you've got Huckleberry Ridge two million years ago, Lewis Canyon, uh, Lava Creek, that's the Yellowstone eruption 600,000 years ago. Um, we've got hominy formation. We've got all these units of different ages. We can actually work out the displacement through time because the, these units are displaced differently depending on what age they are, which is really cool. That's what I'm going to close with. Here. So. Um, that's the, the first tile. And the next tile, you don't see that much red. Well, that's because most of it is covered by this guy. This is the Pitchstone Plateau flow, which is that big high flow. The first one you see when you drive into Yellowstone. Um, he's only 75,000 years old. So he's pretty young. And he, she, I don't know, maybe it's a she. But um, it's, it's a young, young, young um, flow. And so it doesn't have a lot of faulting. So you can think about this like um, if this was a single continuous fault system, you could think about the fault trying to break through. And every time that one of these flows comes out, one of these ignimbrites gets laid down, it's like repaving the road. You know, it's like being in, in, in Houston where they repave the Long Point Fault Road every time the Long Point Fault breaks the road, right? So um, not a lot of faulting here. But as we get further north and get into older units, you start to pick that faulting up again. Um, we move more north into Mallard Lake. This one was really complicated because there's a whole different fault set here um, of a different orientation. You can see these crazy things in here, but you can still see very clearly these active fault scarves just kind of jogging their way up, interestingly, towards the Gallatin Range. Um, and then we get up to the Gallatin Range and you can see them starting to coalesce into a, a very obvious structure that lines up straight in to the Gallatin Range. So it goes straight in there. Now, the implications of this, we're still not sure. This is literally Ryan and Meredith downloaded this data about two months ago. So this is like, we're, we're, we're working through it as quickly as we can. If I put all those together in one figure, this is what it looks like. So this is where the modern Teton fault that's been documented by those guys in the trenches um, sort of disappears into the snake. And then this is what it looks like coming out or what, the, what this normal faulting looks like coming out, excuse me. So the way that we're sort of interpreting this is that th this, and this is how real normal fault systems actually work. We think about the Teton fault as a single structure because it always looks that way. And the reason it looks that way is because most of the places we see the Teton fault, it's two basement blocks that broke apart and started filling on one side. This is a very competent couple of chunks of rock that discreetly break in one place.
but that's not really how it happens most of the time. When you get out of the basement rocks into the soft sediments or even into um, the sedimentary rocks and even into these thin ignimbrites like we have in Yellowstone, um, this is what it actually looks like most of the time. So this is, if any of you have been down to Arches National Park, this is the, one of the most famous fault exposures in the world. This is the Moab fault system. And what you don't see in this outcrop is the actual Moab fault. Everybody knows this is the Moab fault system. The Moab fault is actually back in the hillside about 200 yards, and it's a huge fault that accommodates a lot of motion. But these little guys that are broken all over the place um, are also accommodating some percentage of that extension. Um, this is the Corsair Fault in the Gulf of Mexico at Brazos Ridge, and you can see the same thing. Um, th these, these little faults are all helping this big fault accommodate some of this extension that's happening. What's even more interesting, this is probably more equivalent to what we're seeing up north, because these, these younger units are coming in and filling this space, and when they do, they're only breaking the little bit since they were deposited, right? They haven't seen the rest of the fault history. They came in late. So the Huckleberry Ridge, for instance, at 2 million years should see more of the fault history than the Lewis Canyon that comes in at 800,000, right? The Lewis Canyon should have less displacement. So what Meredith and I decided to do, and Ryan, we decided to map these faults out in little cross sections, these down to the east and down to the west, basically the east-west extension in cross sections, figure out what the displacement was and divide that magnitude of displacement by how long the fault had been there to figure out I mean, how long the unit had been there to figure out what the displacement through time was, and then try to correlate those across the units. And so, um, so I'm going to skip that one actually. This is what we saw. So we went, we started at the south, and we used cross sections across the fault. I was telling Cynthia about it. This particular cross section actually includes the three normal faults: Phillips, Teton, and Open Canyon, um, and potentially needs to include these buttes here. But every one of these red dots is a spot where we did that calculation. Here's one on the pitch stone. Here's one on the Mallard. Uh, that's Mallard, I'm sorry, there. Um, up here at the Gallatin Range, et cetera. And this is what we see. Um, obviously, in the su southernmost tip, there's no displacement, so it's a zero. <laughs> we increase a little bit moving up towards Hoback. Um, and then we get this beautiful arc um, that looks like this for, for the system. So we expect the highest displacement rates to be in the middle of the fault, assuming it's a single fault. We expect them to decay towards the edges as it breaks down. Um, these two guys right here are actually based on tilting of the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff at uh, Signal Mountain. That's a projection into the fault. We don't know if it's correct, right? It's not a bad idea to try to project it in, but it's a long projection. So it may be um, over-exaggerating the amount of displacement over time um, that we're seeing here. But this is what, if we were out mapping a single normal fault, this is the sort of... Um, distribution profile. This one might be a little high here, but we sort of expect this. We don't, we don't see the Teton fault or anything near it dropping to zero, right? So it looks like this is a continuous normal fault, extensional, I'm calling it a shear zone because it's a whole bunch of faults. It's not, it's not a single fault um, that have about, you know, a, a relatively consistent pattern of this um, displacement rate. We still have a lot of work to do on this. I literally made this figure sitting at Cynthia's kitchen today. So um, it, it's all emerging very rapidly. So what happened? That's the, the, the last thing, right? Um, somehow, some way, we lose the topography into the, uh, into the hotspot. And I actually heard Bob Smith bring this up during his talk. He said the same thing, that the, the hotspot itself essentially erases this topography. It sort of falls in there. Um, and we're sort of chasing where that's happening. And so this is another one of those swath profiles, except this one's a long strike. So you can see the average topography of the Tetons. This is the high topography. There's the, there's the grand right there. Um, actually, look at that. The unconformity cuts it, which is incorrect. So I'll have to talk to whoever drew this figure, which was me. <laughs> but you can see it coming right across the top of Mount Moran and comes back down on the other side. There's two interesting things that happen here. Um, this is the thermocron ages, like a gradient of the ages. So you can see that really young pocket of ages that we talked about at Mount Moran where the maximum displacement is. But those ages um, up high, they drop off really quickly as we move towards Eagle's Rest. The other thing that's really incredible, and I didn't catch this, my geomorph colleague who doesn't even work on the Tetons that did the swath for me saw it, um, is this. Just north of Mount Moran, the average topography drops like half a kilometer. It happens again um, just up north in Flag Ranch where the 
um, where the unconformity dips down. These two events are dropping this stuff about seven to 800 kilometers. This, this one's not a half kilometer drop, it's a few hundred meters. But then at the Snake River Caldera boundary, as mapped out by Christensen and Love, it drops again about, I don't know, Goldsby and I have estimated from our mapping about 600 meters. So now we've gotten rid of one and a half kilometers of topography along three structures that parallel the Yellowstone hotspot. The total relief at Mount Moran is only 1.8 kilometers. So we've wiped out most of that topography. Now this work is still very immature and has a long way to go. And this is what Goldsby um, and some others are gonna be working on in the coming years. But it's not crazy to think that structures along strike um, that are parallel to the hotspot that cut the Teton Fault could actually drop this topography down. Interestingly, this boundary right here happens where the Teton Fault takes that really hard jog to the right and goes around Eagle's Rest Peak. We don't think it's a coincidence because if you follow that liniment to the west, it actually offsets the drainages in Idaho the same amount. So, um, and I didn't, I didn't include that figure here. But um, anyway, in conclusion, um, I'm not going to read these. This is, you know, it's all this, all this good stuff. Um, we're, I noticed my battery's about to die. I forgot to plug it in. Um, but this is Goldsby up mapping in the north. This is a, a beautiful waterfall section cutting through the Huckleberry Ridge B unit, which we finally learned how to map. Um, so we're continuing this work, chasing the fault north, chasing the fault system north, and potentially linking it up with the Gallatin Range. Now, the last thing I promised you um, was a little teaser about what's going to happen in September. So we've been shooting at the same time, we've been working on the long-term history. We've also been looking at the lake record for um, a variety of reasons. And we finally snatched one of these incredible seismic lines. Um, and you can see these, these, little, these little weird low reflectivity zones in here. So these are all lake mud layers mostly in here. We've got these low re reflectivity zones with the arrows pointing to them. Those are mass transport complexes, places where sediment has slid down the hill. Well, a lot of them that are happening at the same time interval in different parts of the lake, we think are tied to earthquake events. And we're hoping to core through this, these sediments and figure out what the timing of these events are. There's 130 meters of sediment in here, which may be all Pinedale, but we think that maybe there's something in here that's, that's older than, than the Pinedale glaciation which might be the first, uh, the first glimpse we would get um, into a potential earthquake history that predates Pondale glaciation. We have a coring rig supposedly coming from Austria in September, and on its way to its new home in Minnesota, it's gonna be stopping here to try to pull an 80 meter core from Jackson Lake in the deepest part of the lake, um, basically right where that blue line is. Um, no idea if we'll be successful, no idea how it'll come out, but that's what we're going for, so. Thank you very much. So now with that, um, I'll leave you with this slide. Um, when you're a bunch of structural geologists and you're out and you find a potential fault scarp, you take a picture on it like it's a dead animal that you killed. It's an elephant <laughs> trophy. It's our trophy kill. So this is most of my crew, uh, well, big chunk of my crew last field season. So um, with that, I'll take any of your questions and thanks for. Thanks for uh, coming and listening. Yeah, we've seen, I mean, I've seen the same argument for, oh, sorry. Yeah, let me see if I can do that, actually. Um, so the, the question was, there's Eocene volcanics high on, is it not Eocene? They're, uh, they're six million year old volcanics. What are, what are those, Goldsby, do you know? We did, but we didn't write it down apparently. Well, there are only andesites and basalts. Yeah, so there's andesites and basalts that are, on, that are high up on Teton Pass where the mountain range has been uplifted by the fault. And the, um, the question was, people have interpreted those as
Ryan, you muted yourself uh, on the Zoom. Let's see, there we go. Okay, good. Yeah, better. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Um, and I, so I don't know. I mean, that's a paleo topography question, really. So, I, and that was, I, I don't, I don't want to call it circumstantial, but that was sort of one of the things I, I pointed to that there's a lot of these little, like, um, another one that, that will be pointed to quite frequently is at Signal Mountain. There, the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff, the, the B member is beautifully exposed. And I wouldn't have known that was the B member until Ryan drug me around the field for two weeks and tortured me in the, in the woods. But the B member is totally exposed. And then the Tiwanot, which is 10 million years old, which is quite a bit older than the Huckleberry Ridge, is exposed behind Signal Mountain. Um, and it has a dip that's about the same as the Huckleberry Ridge. And the argument is, shouldn't they have this? Uh, shouldn't the Tiwanot have a much steeper dip if it's much older? And I don't know if you saw in the, in the um, models that I was showing, but the dips of those units are very for a range of reasons, depending on how that motion is accommodated. And so for me, it's hard to, it's hard to take those, that one place and throw out all the other data, but it's, it still needs to be considered. And I think it's really important. And also, yeah, and then also, what is it? Stealing out again, yeah. And then also, John Geisman gave us a plot, and he was looking at the flows of the Huckleberry Gulf in Idaho. And I don't remember it, but I just remember after listening to him, I thought, oh, the people on the left, they don't do it. No. Okay, unfortunately, you know, but he was looking at how they flow the flows and what could they need to do. I think my argument to that would be it may not have been there because when the when the eruption happens, that's when we think the topography from the range collapses. In fact, I think I mean, if you oh, see, I can't. Sure, sure. Sorry. I mean, if you go back to this is that image, um, you can see this is the Huckleberry Ridge and you can see the Teton range is sort of. Um, dug its little space out. Now you could argue that if it started uplifting after Huck Ridge was erupted, then it's just been eroded away and that's why it's not there. But my argument would be that it would, you know, basically the range topography would have dropped into the caldera during or after that Huckleberry Ridge eruption. And I, I'll admit that I am not a caldera person. In fact, it is like so far out of, I just mapped my first ignimbrites um, two weeks ago. I think though there's there's there were some other things about um, pollen distribution and the topography not being there, and I I just think those things are they're tough. It's I will say this Thermocron data set is is one of the largest single data sets in the world, and a lot of those would require that we would throw out all that data if if this isn't so. Well, what's the error of that Is there things that when you know, like a lot of the radioactive data, there's problems with some of them. Then there's others to double check. Like, what's the problem from, say, appetite to what more? Tons. Yeah. So he, the question is, what are the error bars or what are the problems, the fundamental problems with the appetite thermochronology? And the answer is a lot. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, and there's a lot of challenges with quality of grains and how they get analyzed. We sort of, my response to that, I guess, is that we brute forced it. We collected a ton. We usually collect two, three kilograms of sample, pick all these pretty appetites out of them, and all everything goes to plan. That never happens here. So most of my students and myself have been tortured by carrying 10 or 15 kilos per sample out of these mountains, crushing all this up and refining it down to you know a few grains, but we're running tons and tons of grains. The other piece of it, I would say, so to answer your question simply too, the errors are usually on the order of a million or two years, but, but they, they can vary. Um, but we collect a lot of grains so that we can find the outliers. But the age, the uplift age that we get, this rapid uplift age, we see it in five different transects. And to me, it's just tough to, yeah, it's very consistent. The older one, 
older uplift we don't know as much about but yeah it's it's fairly consistent but but i also i i'm a believer that whatever we do here has to fit this other data that you're talking about because that data even though it might be a smaller data set is just as important and i think that's you know that that that's our responsibility to figure out how to make that data fit in our interpretation because you you know you're not going to throw it out it's important we have a question i'd like to um to, to say, Brian, and that is, can you revisit the question of recent Teton earthquakes, where the most recent events tied to the glacial rebound was the fault now quiescent or static and no longer a threat to the community, or is the Teton range still dynamic and the activity would be said to stay an ongoing process? I mean, do I need to, did you, you read that? Yeah. Read okay. Yeah, yeah. So the answer is I'm not the right person to answer that question. That question should go to the guys at, at, in Golden at the Hazard Center or to someone like Glenn Thackeray at, at Idaho State. Um, the phenomenon to which that question refers, I think there was a 2007 paper by um, Andrea Hampel and Ralph Hetzel that showed that when the Yellowstone ice cap retreats, the isostatic adjustment um, allowed the Teton Fault to slip a whole bunch of times very quickly right after coming out of the last glaciation. And it may have you know, filled its slip budget and didn't, didn't, doesn't need to slip for 5,000 years. And maybe it is quiescent, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that any of us definitely have the answer to that. But I mean, I think it's a great idea. I think Darren Larson's work, when he talked here in March, I think he addressed that, didn't he? That, that he, he was starting to think in his lake records that he was seeing maybe a number of, of, of earthquakes um, happening closer together coming out of the glaciation and then sort of slowing um, as it got to that last earthquake we see in the trench rate record about 5,000 years ago. But um, those guys would definitely be better for that question than, than me. They're the experts. So Ryan, I have comments um, that very recently, in fact, it was announced in our local paper that the Wyoming Geological Survey on it, yeah, geological survey just published a basement map, a pre-Cambrian basement map across all of the state of Wyoming. And when you look at that map in detail, what it shows is that the maximum depth of the pre-Cambrian basement underneath Jackson Hole is right in front of Mount Moran, which is quite a completely independent data set, which I find very compelling saying that Moran is the center of the middle of the of where the Teton fault initiated and started yeah. because it is a deep valley. I think yeah and I, I think it's also fair to wonder why the deepest hole in the in the hanging wall is in the middle of Jackson Lake right in front of Mount Moran as well Mount Moran and Eagles Rest. You know that's a lot of people think that the that Jackson Lake is a glacial trough but maybe it's just a hanging wall that's sediment starved. So no, I, I don't, I mean, I, I, I've seen the map that you talk about. Um, I was very interested to see that. I don't know where that data comes from because they didn't have any well control. I suspect it was maybe, maybe magnetic or um, maybe gravity, uh, but we've tried to work the gravity profiles from some of the data here and it's, it's, it's kind of thin. We've talked about doing a new gravity traverse, but yeah, I think it's, I mean, that would be, the offset I calculated on that was about 31,000 feet, which was, I don't remember what that was, about nine kilometers of vertical offset because it, it would be straight vertical, which would be almost identical to what we've shown in the models here. Nine kilometers vertical, so it's like 10, 11, 12 total displacement, which is right. Yeah. I don't know. We need to, it's, I, um, Ryan and Goldsby and I actually owe the director of the Wyoming survey a uh, thank you email because she, um, sort of sponsored or gave the thumbs up for our EDMAP project to USGS. And so um, we'll reach out to her and ask her how they, how they came to that, because I don't actually know, but it was great. But yeah, good things. The question was, how did the Buck Mountain Fault um, affect our displacement values? And that's the fault that's, that's between Static Peak and Buck Mountain, correct? Mm -hmm. 
it's uh what's well, it it well it shouldn't it well since it, it at buck mountain that's our static peak transect and there's no faults between where we've where the teton fault and where we've sampled so it shouldn't have an impact on it on that part of it that being said i'm being i'm becoming very interested in what goes on with the four ellen peak fault um i don't know the 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 positioning of the buck mountain fault as well as i should but i have started trying to draw in a long strike cross section through there and it is it's not simple it's actually one of the most challenging cross sections i've ever tried to draw so i wish i had a better answer for you but but i'm not i'm not sure it's at static peak it shouldn't affect our displacement estimates at all but i don't know about the longer reaching implications of it so ryan we have another chat question uh which is if a large portion of the Teton range has been erased, where did the material go? Is it possible to identify material in the slope of the planet? So this, I, I'm not the first person to suggest that this is um, that this stuff has gone away into the Snake River Plain. Actually, um, Nadine McCory and Dave Rogers wrote a paper um, in 1998, maybe when she was a master's student at Idaho State, that talked about all of these mountain ranges sort of folding into the range. Unfortunately, though, like, and you'd think that would be easy to see all of these mountain ranges dropping into the Snake River Plain. Unfortunately, most of these rocks are basement that have the same density as your common rhyolites and volcanic rocks. So it's like you wouldn't, what would you look for? And, and I don't know the answer to that. I, I was hoping that um, Bob Smith would show up tonight because that was one of the questions I had for him. So. And if you were to, but like for Lewis or Shelby, um, and you find like the age of, you know, the 50,000 year old um, box versus like an 800 year old rock by like some source, like is that possible where you can see like even more? Yeah, I, I I don't know, and we're yeah we're going to take a crack at some of the shallow imaging of some of these ignimbrites um, when our geophysics team gets here this weekend. But geophysics up there has been like corings. All you, you're obviously you're, you'd have to drill, and these are national parks, right? So we're never going to. I mean, the coring we're talking about doing is taking a soft sediment barrel and sticking it through mud. You know, we're not going to be out there drill. You know, drilling and. But yeah, I mean, I don't imagine there'll ever be any drilling in this park, which is probably a good thing. Um, but the geophysics would be our next thing. But it's just, I mean, it, it's been, the, the sediment that sits in this hole is full of cobbles and glacial till and all the stuff that no imaging technique seems to work on. Gravity might be something that would work, but I'm not a geophysicist. Um, so I'll leave that to my geophysics colleagues, but it's, yeah, I mean, I, I think even Exxon, like as part of a, it wasn't for an, an exploration survey, but I think it was like a trying to help out another science group. I think somebody that's been here longer than me could say, but they tried to shoot through this stuff and it just wrecked the statics. Like they couldn't get any energy back. They couldn't. And that's what happens to us with our chirp data. We'll, we'll get this beautiful image that you saw in our cross section. And when it hits the glacial till, it's gone. So we just can't get through this stuff and see anything. So you'll, now you have a sandwich that's basement, all this sediment, and then a bunch of ignimbrite flows. And what we're hoping to image are just the thin ignimbrites and be able to actually see the offsets on them. But we don't know if it's gonna work. We're gonna try super stacking ground penetrating radar. Um, we're, we, we threw some shear wave at it last year. We're, we're throwing everything we can. What does that mean? Oh, oh yeah so i mean yeah sorry <laughs> sorry um it means that we shot some shear wave surveys along grassy lake road last year at test surveys to see what sort of penetration depths we would get and see what the imaging looked like so shear wave um is basically all geophysics is sending generally sending some sort of wave into the ground mm -hmm. and having it come back after it hits things or or refracts or reflects off of something um, God, you're going to make me explain shear wave. I'm a, I'm a structural geologist, Cynthia. My geophysics colleague will be here on Sunday if anybody wants to talk to him. We'll be in Flag Ranch Campground. 
but no, it's a, it's just another technique. Gra ground penetrating radar, shear wave. It's just different ways of sending waves into the ground to try to see what we image. But they all they all handle things a little bit differently. What we really hoped to do was when Jackson Lake was frozen, we were going to shoot this GPR survey, this ground penetrating radar survey across the northern part of Jackson Lake where the fault crosses, because when the lake's frozen, the ice in the water provides a perfect medium for that. But unfortunately, the Bureau of Reclamation blew the bottom out of the lake, the water dropped below the mud line, and then it never came back up. So there was a Snake River channel in the way of that transect all winter, and we weren't able to do that shoot. But we're, we're, what I mean by throwing everything we can at it is we're trying every geophysical technique that we, we have available to us. The one we really want to do that will probably never be permitted is a vibrocyce, which is where we bring in, we have a trailer that has a big, super heavy metal plate. I don't know how much the one on this vibrocyce weighs. Sometimes they're a thousand pounds or something. And it pounds the ground in discrete pulses and sends energy very deep. So we can do really long seismic lines and, and ideally see a lot deeper than other surveys. But once again, bringing an instrument into a park with a bunch of animals and a bunch of natural processes going on and then pounding the ground with it is not something that, you know, I, I, want, I don't want to be there when it happens. They were testing it in Oklahoma actually the other day. And, uh, you know, I, I was just like, we have, we've talked about it along Grassy Lake Road, but it's not, a, it's not a, anything I've even broached with the Park Service and, and probably won't. So, yes. Ryan, uh, can you explain when I think of the greatest displacement, I would presume that that would be the highest part of the range, but there's obviously a, about 1,300 foot more difference in elevation between Grand and Moran. Moran still has flathead right now, which is you don't know how much of the grand road is, you know, where that had to be, it would still exist in that grand. But can you explain some of that, like the, the sort of the geometry there of why yeah, sure. there's greater displacement? So the or just put a shorter piece. Yeah. So the question was why is why is the highest displacement in the middle uh, at Mount Moran and why is that not the tallest area? Why is the grand taller, even though it has less displacement? And I think the answer to that is, is really complicated, and this is going to be a little bit of a punt too, but um, one, I, I think there's, there's other events that have affected this mountain range. The Gravant uplift, I think, plays a role, and I don't exactly know how. Um, these other structures I've talked about that maybe Mount Moran and parts around it have been dropped down, but also that the, most of the erosion in the system has occurred because we've had these huge glaciers. So who knows what this place looked like before the Quaternary when these glaciers cut these valleys, but those glaciers set the base level for erosion. And there's a huge glacial valley on each side of Mount Moran, but the Grand doesn't have that, that sort of base level setter. So the Grand is almost like in a way armored erosionally in a way that Moran is not. Moran's got those two big, drain, big glacial drainages on each side that sort of sawed away at that topography and made the Moran topography really steep. Once again, I can't quantitatively show you that that's how it all works, but I think the erosional history here, the erosional story is more is a little bit more complicated. Um, and it's left, as a matter of fact, Mount Moran, and there's a paper by David Foster in 2008, where he calls Mount Moran and the Grand Teton Teflon peaks, which means they're sort of like lubricated from the erosion. They sort of stick up way above their surrounding topography in a way that can't be explained using normal erosion rules. And that's really more of a geomorphic problem, but yeah, I agree with you. I mean, it would make sense. And can you get an early slide that showed the uh, Moreno offsets? Can you bring that back? Um, and are those all in meters? Yes, they are. Yep. Yeah, usual, the, in most places, the Moreno offsets like 12, yeah, 12 to 13. Um, on the shoulders, on the lateral moraines, you'll get these higher values, but those are probably pre-Pinedale. You know, those lateral moraines are gonna survive. When you look at the terminal moraines, um, they, they generally have you know, 12, some of them have six. I don't know, Glenn Thackeray and uh, Amy Staley wrote a paper about this in Geosphere in 2017, where they went along and measured every single one of these. Um, in the LIDAR, like all the way along strike. And it was largely, I mean, almost to the point that you could date the glacial feature by using the offset on it. 
so that they're that consistent. These, we did include those in our displacement rate estimates there. I should have pointed out that all of those estimates were either kilometers per million years or meters per thousand years, which is basically the same unit. All right. Are we good on Zoom? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Biden. Thanks for coming here to the auditorium. Thank you to everybody on Zoom. And huge thanks, Ryan, for coming all the way across the country here to to give us this talk. Sure. So with that, Mike Adler, I think we can stop the Zoom presentation. And...